The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Tiger Technician Hour with your host, Basil Chapman. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Chapman. What's going on, folks? This is Jacob filling in for Basil. Today we got a lot going on. Everything's taken off on the open. Uh, the GDX is down 109. The dollar definitely flirted with that 103 area and, and it popped over. So looks like we might get to 106 again. We'll see what happens. Um, again, I've been following this every time I've been on, uh, but the dollar continues to be, uh, you know, pretty strong comparatively speaking. Uh, big news today, this guy is in, it's like, there's like five headlines every morning and it's saying something different about him and I, I don't understand how someone could have so much presence in the news. Um, Tesla came out today, uh, I think yesterday they were showing um, some new developments in their AI robots, right? They're called Optimus, the Tesla Optimus. This thing is a big issue that I've continued to bring up regarding Tesla is they have so many ongoing projects. It's like, you know, if you have ADHD, that's what happens, right? You, you start new projects all the time. You can never follow through. And this is what it seems to be at Tesla. So we're, there's this video that they released 16 hours ago of their, uh, it's, it's a bipedal, you know, hom hominid bot basically. And they're pushing this as like the new kind of product line. They're also pushing a new vehicle uh, they haven't really come out with. One of the things I found funny in the video uh, about the Tesla bot update uh, is it was walking around the factory uh, doing, you know, whatever is needed in front of Cybertrucks, which is again, another product that they have that has not been released yet. And this just seems to be uh, an issue they have. This also comes on top of him saying that they're not necessarily immune to any kind of global recession or, uh, you know, depressionary, um, macroeconomic situations. So, you know, the, the hype factor is so real with Tesla. I mean, we're up 2.5% right now from the open. I mean, in January, the beginning of this year, we were, you know, we were down at like the 100 mark. And it's, it went all the way back up to 200. And now we're floating around this area. You know, it will probably be like a small consolidation in this bound since there's not, you know, an immense amount of volume regarding uh, its movements. But the other thing I want to say, too, is, is, you know, he's releasing a new AI that's going to combat GPT, or so it's said. The thing, that, the issue I have looking at everything with the autonomous robots and kind of uh, that whole industry is if you're talking like bipedal stuff, right, things that look like humanoid and they, they do similar actions, you have a company, Boston Dynamics, and I'm sure you all are familiar with that. If you're not, I'd really recommend uh, looking into some of their robots, uh, just because it's so Im impressive what these things can do. It, these things are eons above whatever Tesla just demonstrated with their Optimus spot. It's also to be stated, too, is that when you're working in factory conditions, it, it's not necessarily that the human form is the most effective, right? Like, there's already a lot of autonomous bots and uh, that, that, that exist in factories, right? you know, from arms to uh, gluing things, anything like that, right? A lot of factories ha have a huge part of the chain being automated. And that's what makes me feel like these Optimus bots are, again, much more of like a gimmick than anything effective. I mean, how many, if you want to talk about personal assistance, right, which is one of the ways that they uh, demonstrated the function of this bot, it's like, who's really going to have that? Um, so, you know, at least... Regarding this hype, I don't think it, it means much for, for Tesla in like a, a temporal sense, um, but but certainly it keeps that mythos going, right? And I'm not I, I'm not someone who's against uh, experimental kind of technologies that maybe aren't immediately um, profitable, but still, I just we, we have this continuing ongoing pattern um, over at Tesla where they are releasing these new kind of things or teasing them. And uh, then we get two, three years down the line, nothing's out yet. And then we now have a huge swath of new products as well that are supposed to come out. So we'll see what happens. Also, it, it didn't seem like it affected it too much. Um, but George Soros's management fund totally got rid of all their stake uh, in Tesla. That prompted Elon saying that he looked like Magneto. 
And it, again, it's just, I don't think we've ever, at least in, in, in my life, have seen a CEO uh, that acts quite like Elon and certainly not a man who is, you know, quote unquote, the richest in the world. It's really fascinating. Another company I want to look at today is Raytheon. So Raytheon, what, what they do is essentially make something called, well, they make a lot of things. Uh, but they make a missile called the MALD missile, M-A-L-D. And these are, they have not been given out to any other people, as far as we know, up until now. The U.S. uses them. What it does is it's a decoy missile, right? So one of the, the, the standard for, I guess, warfare today is going to be uh, air defense. Uh, well, air supremacy and therefore air defense follows, right? What the MALD does is it's a decoy and it makes it look, uh, it could be anything. It make it look like a missile, make it look like a plane, anything on the enemy radar. And it distracts resources towards that point. And this is how the Ukrainians have been uh, penetrating so deep um, into Russian held territory and, and, and hitting strategic points beyond or behind the uh, air defense net that Russia has. And I have always said that these defense stocks are gonna be so prime uh, so much talk is going on about any kind of global conflict, and not to say that that will actually happen, um, but the, the, the communication and the conversation is there, and when that conversation is there, these stocks are going to be uh, pretty nice. In January, the beginning of this year, you had this bump up to 108. It seemed like it was just absorbed, and we're kind of just flirting around this, you know, 100 area. Seriously, I... I I think we're going to see more stuff come out if this conflict doesn't end soon. Uh, you'll see more of these technologies that really aren't on the mainstream kind of coming to light. And we'll just see really the, 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 the scope of uh, items that these companies have. Same with Lockheed Martin. I mean, it's nuts. But anyways, I would recommend if anyone's interested just like in general engineering like that, like, take a look. It's called the, uh, the ADM-160 MALD. On top of that as well, uh, I want to take a look at Steel Dynamics. This is, again, a company I talk about a lot. We had a sell-off um, of it. Charts aren't loading. But I can talk a little bit about it, right? We were at the one, I think, 132 for quite a while. There we go. 136 was the high. And I'm on a three-year now, but I was just looking for the last day with volume, which would have been December of last year. We did touch that mark here, but it, you know, didn't bite, went back up, and then we actually fell back down through that level, which is about the $100 area. And we've been going up and down. And I was curious, I was like, you know, why is this really happening with Steel Dynamics? Um, other steel companies have experience as well, and there are some macro factors, um, really more in the short term, regarding there's a lot of supply right now that just came out, and so prices, excuse me, there's a lot of demand currently, and supply is about to meet up with it, so the prices for steel might be a little overinflated. What I found out, too, is that um, Citigroup actually changed it from a buy to neutral, but they changed a lot of the other uh, steel stocks, such as Nucor. Um, they raised, uh, like, 20 bucks or something like that, like something like a 10% increase to a buy. And so it's weird. We'll take a little bit more of a look uh, at that when we get back, and we have a lot more to talk about, so stay tuned, folks. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. 
The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. I love that intro sound. Anyways, okay, so we were talking about steel before we left for the break. So City did raise the target um, for Nucor new about 10% from 145 to 160. Um, obviously we're not there yet, uh, so, but it, it's say, it's, it looks like it's making kind of the same moves as Steel Dynamics did, right? Like kind of hit, we don't have like a huge amount of volume on it, but, um, you know, kind of flirting with this 138 dips down and it's kind of sitting there. We'll see what happens. It's just, it really is interesting to me. And the other one they had is X, which I don't think anyone really, well, that's not what I meant. Let's see. United States Steel Corp. And that just is kind of doing worse. Uh, over the month. Anyways, I'm, you know, until the next kind of earnings come out for Steel Dynamics, I'm going to be looking to see if this is an opportunity. I'm not sure yet, for myself at least. Again, I, I just, this, I, I love this stock playing it a while back. So we'll see what happens. Uh, some other big news, uh, NVIDIA, they are doing some interesting stuff, right? Okay, so they make your CPUs, your GPUs, all these kind of things. One of the other things that they're making that they're about to uh, kind of really flood the market with is something called the DPUs, which is a data processing unit, okay? And so for a long time, your CPU, you know, that would handle, uh, you know, like network interactions. It would handle like some security factors. And they made something called the NIC board, um, which is in all your computers, and that was what basically was delegated uh, network traffic and all that kind of stuff. Well, that still apparently is not enough, so they're coming out with DPUs. Uh, I think they're called like blue stretch threes or something like that. Um, but it's it's big news because someone was asking why NVIDIA has this like massive run up, right? And they have a high PE and all of that, and they just continually are coming out with uh, kind of new ways to revolutionize what we're doing, right? The, the NIC board was so interesting because it put a server on the board itself, right? And the DPU is just going to increase that. So we have some, it's funny how like the way that this branch of technology works is it seems like you start off with like five things and then you merge it into one and then that forks into two and then you get five again and we just keep going through that process. Um, so I'm sure in the future they'll, you know, put the NIC board and the DPU back in the CPU, but it'll, it'll be interesting. And I, 
I, I mean, this is past a price point for me. Um, and they've obviously had an extreme run up with, you know, kind of declining volume. Uh, but, but they still continue to create things uh, that that are useful, right? Like, I think the DPU will really, uh, it, when it becomes super mainstream, and especially the new one that they're coming out with, um, it really will be a big thing. Um, so we'll see what goes on that. And some, some lighter news with NVIDIA, and I love every time I'm on bringing up something to do with, I don't know, maybe a new scientific discovery or something that's going on. It's just kind of neat. Um, NVIDIA actually posted this on their blog, uh, and they're, this company is using NVIDIA GPUs to bring back the, the woolly mammoth, which is nuts. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that. It's Jurassic Parkish, but part of me is like, yeah, I'd love to see a woolly mammoth in my life. Uh, startup seeks to bring back extinct species by harnessing AI and technologies, including the NVIDIA GPUs and Parabricks. Um, so this is... Uh, George Church, just colossal bioscience. They they have a YouTube channel, I think, and I've I've watched them a few times. It's pretty it's pretty interesting. Um, so there's plenty of work to be done on endangered species. Anyways, the, the point is is they're using AI and CRISPR, and uh, that's that's being supported um, by the video. Now, is that really like a, a reason to buy the video or the stock or you know make any move on it? Not really, but it is cool just to kind of see what Nvidia is in and just really how wide reaching. Uh, they are. So kind of on the same topic um, with technology, we can talk about obviously the big news um, with TSM. And again, not like a nothing really big happened, but but Warren Buffett, uh, Berkshire Hathaway um, sold its entire stake, which I think was like four point one billion. Um, you know, they have a major exposure right now. And this is one of the things you always want to like keep in mind. We we'd speak about this in like international economics classes, and really it just it goes for investment in general. But when you're investing in kind of things overseas or that are stationed overseas, you do have to take in consideration kind of what the political situation is out there um, and what the risks are, right? And so obviously, uh, China has been very vocal and wanting Taiwan. America has been very vocal in that they're not getting Taiwan. And there is, you know, every now and then in the news, you, you hear some kind of aggressive posturing. Anyways, the, the point is, is there kind of is a big risk exposure, like tangibly uh, with TSM. If China were to invade, right, um, that those factories are going to be the first ones to go away because America is not going to want China to get any of that information. Um, so they, they run a big risk. They are a strategic target um, in an area of the world that is really heating up. So it kind of makes sense that TSM, uh, or excuse me, that Berkshire Hathaway sold out of it. I, I don't know if all of it makes sense. And I think that was only over like a half a year period. So there's probably a little bit more to that that has, um, you know, more to do than just with it being in a strategic position. Um, but it's interesting to keep in mind regardless. Uh, on top of that as well, and again, this is more exposure like on Apple's, excuse me, um, or exposure you get when you're working with this company or investing in it, is uh, Apple has booked 90% of TSMC's three nanometer production capacity uh, for the year, which is massive. It's good for TSM and obviously good for Apple since they have a supplier and a steady one as well. But, you know, what happens if something like this occurs, right? What happens if the TSM uh factories get hit or something like that. Again, I think it's very low chance, but uh, Apple booked nearly 90% of chip supplier TSMC's first generation three nanometer process capacity this year for future iPhones, Macs, and iPads. Um, Apple's upcoming iPhone 15 Pro models are expected to feature the A17 Bionic processor and Apple's first iPhone chip based on TSMC's first generation processors. It's said to deliver 35% power efficiency improvement and 15% faster performance compared to the 4 nanometer. So, you know, if everything stays kind of constant, I mean, this is going to be good for Apple as well, right? We all want faster stuff. There's only so much you can do design-wise. On Apple's level as well, uh, this is so insane to read. And it just really shows you that this market is driven by behemoths. Uh, this is a stock market milestone. Apple is now worth more than the entire Russell 2000. 
Uh, the market capitalization of Apple Incorporated it has surpassed the entire Russell 2000 for two weeks, the longest stretch on record. Uh, Apple's market capitalization, which measures how much the company is worth based on the value of all its outstanding stock, surpassed that of the RUT on April 27th and is held higher through Monday. That's this past Monday. The only other time that occurred was September 1st, 2020, uh, when Apple's valuation passed out of the small cap index for only a day. The premium over this group of small cap stocks continued to widen over the past two weeks as the consumer technology giant reported earnings that surpassed Wall Street analysts' expectations. We'll talk more about it. Again, these guys are spanning out. Are they going to start uh, releasing, you know, Netflix-style documentaries, which they're talking about doing? Or how well is the Apple Pay doing with that 4% savings? I mean, these guys are really spreading out. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TF. NN.com. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. All right, so I was looking at the den, which if you're not in, you got to get in, guys. It's, it's $1, and you're missing out if you're not in it. But S1 uh, shared an article uh, from the Motley Fool, saying Kathy Woods is revising her <laughs> her Bitcoin uh, projection to 1.48 million. You know, I don't know really what the singularity is that achieves that. But what I do know is there has been some interesting stuff uh, regarding Bitcoin. What I what I mean um, is you have a stable coin called Tether, right? 
and they released an update saying that they're going to start allocating up to 15% of its net realized operating profits uh, towards purchasing Bitcoin, and that's going to be used as their minimum reserve asset. So it's going to be interesting to see that, and that 100% backs Tether tokens. That's decent for Tether, I think. It's decent for Bitcoin as well. Some other thing that came to my attention a few days ago was that the secret, and this is in crypto, the Secret Service uh, had an, a Reddit AMA, which is an Ask Me Anything, about cryptocurrency. And it was super interesting, and I would just, even if you're not into crypto, I would strongly recommend, you can just Google that, and I can also share it in the den uh, as well in a little bit after the show. Uh, but they were answering crypt crypto questions, essentially. Of course, the number one thing asked was, do you have crypto? And the answer is yes, but they have it. Uh, not because they're holders um, or apes or anything like that, but because they needed to study it. One of the things that was interesting is they, they like the blockchain because it actually helps them trace funds. Now, obviously, they can't necessarily tell who is doing what, but they can see large sums of money being transferred over the blockchain, right? Because it's a public ledger. That's the whole point of it. So the, the, the privacy regarding who's sending what is, uh, that still exists, but it never existed that they couldn't tell how much was being sent, right? Uh, I mean, this is a quote from the Secret Service, uh, whatever representative was answering this. It says, the beauty of the blockchain helps us trace funds, but attributing wallets to individuals is a different story. It's only anonymous until it's not. But even then, in every instance, we have applicable laws and we must follow judicial processes when working to identify bad actors. And, you know, I mean, this is a this is a massive thing. Uh, if you have a profile on someone that you're looking at and, you know, they maybe you have intelligence that they're about to buy this and you see a big move on the blockchain that's worth something similar to that. You know, it's obviously all, you know, it's not not a direct piece of evidence, but it definitely helps you get a, a footing on something. And then someone asked about Monero, which is a privacy enhancing coin. Uh, and it's, you can't really tell what's being transferred and what amount. And then so they responded, our friends at the Department of Justice, consider the use of AECs, um, excuse me, such as Monero, to be high-risk activity, and that is indicative of possible criminal conduct. Uh, conduct. Anyways, I thought that was super interesting. Um, you know, this is definitely on the radar of intelligence agencies. Um, so it, it's pretty interesting to see. So let's see. We had someone, I had someone email me, basically, asking about GE, right? And let's see if we can pull up GE. They're saying that it has a PE of 13, and they see it as maybe like a value or growth. And, you know, I'm not so sure about the growth, but one of the things I like looking at, at least fundamentals uh, on stocks, is their they're kind of like their debt ratios, right? And so one of the things I, I don't, I don't have the fundamentals up, but I read it, was writing notes on it. So th their debt essentially is 32.4 billion. That's down from December, it has a huge cash reserve. And this is really what gets, at least when you're paying interest, right? And we'll get to like the inter interest coverage. Um, and it's, you know, how much is your EBIT kind of, essentially, you know, how many times can you pay off your interest? Um, of course, cash is really important for that, right? Because you're paying off interest with the cash. So you had a debt of 32.4 billion, which was down from December, a massive cash reserve of 21.8 billion, and that's uh, basically making a net debt of about 10.6. Uh, there's yearly, yearly liabilities of uh, 56 billion and longer terms of 93. Then on the short term, which we want to look at regarding debt, uh, they have a cash of 21.8, of course, and then short term receivables of 20. So the total out. Uh, their total liabilities do outweigh uh, their short-term assets and cash, but um, if we want to look at debt to EBITDA, excuse me, EBITDA um, and interest coverage, uh, we have the debt to EBITDA ratio of 1.3, and that's pretty good for the market. You kind of want that under three, and uh, your interest coverage ratio is above four, which is super solid, and the EBIT is 84% free cash flow. So GE, at least on kind of the debt, is looking decent, that's the major thing that I looked at regarding it. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I don't own GE or anything like that. Uh, I just wanted to 
answer my opinion on on that question for one of our listeners. So we want to talk a little bit about C Limited. Uh, let's see if we can pull that up here. They crashed pretty freaking hard. Let's see. Oh, I just had the ticker. There we go. Aha, S E, not G E. So these crashed pretty significantly. And so we're going to go over to Reuters a little bit and read what they were saying. So, um, and this, this is so funny because Tommy was just talking about uh, chat GPT writing stuff and AI writing it. It seems like the opening to this is absolutely written by an AI. Um, but it says the 41 billion Southeast Asian internet giant retreated from overseas markets, slashed marketing spends, and shed thousands of jobs. Still, that wasn't enough for the company to meet earnings estimates on Tuesday. Uh, a subsequent 18% drop in its U.S. shares uh, is obviously a reality check. Um, the Singapore headquartered C posted positive earnings for a second consecutive quarter, and the 87 million net profit was about one third of what analysts had penciled in. Uh, it blamed the miss on a 118 million goodwill impairment charge uh, from a prior acquisition. Dang. Revenue from its gaming unit tumbled 52%, while e commerce grew by a similar amount. Uh, the negative investor reaction trims C shares price gains this year to 39%, though it has still outperformed U.S. listed peers. Uh, the CEO Lee is assuring the market that the company he built, which is once valued over $200 billion, uh, is more than self-sufficient. In his first media interview uh, in two years published this week, he emphasized pushing down costs is going to be long-term mode. Uh, C has banned business class flights, capped daily meal expenses at $30, and moved snacks from offices. And that we're seeing that a lot, right? Kind of like a, a cutting down at the higher levels, especially for like bonuses and stuff like that. Another big news thing, and this has been going on for years, is the Microsoft acquisition of Activision. And th this is so massive. Activision is huge. These are one of the guys along with EA that basically started the concepts of microtransactions and video games. And that seems kind of ridiculous that it'd be such a big market, but it really is. Um, especially from EA's perspective, they own FIFA, which is the soccer video game, and the rest of the world is in love with this video game, and they buy all day long. We obviously have things like Call of Duty over here that younger people play, and I guess even people my age still play video games, and now we have money, and so their profits are so high. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this and still some of the hurdles they have uh, before this merger comes, but this EU approval is massive and they've been working so hard to get it. Folks, stay tuned. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. Are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee. 
at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Biotech is booming, but for how long? Whether you think the biotech bull has room to run or has run its course, trade LABU or LABD. Direction's daily S&P Biotech three times bull and bear ETFs. Visit directioninvestments.com slash biotech today. An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the Direction shares carefully before investing. The prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a prospectus or summary prospectus, please contact Direction shares at 866-476-7523. The prospectus or summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors, such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Okay, folks, we're back. Uh, we're talking about the merger with Microsoft and Activision Blizzard. One of the things I do want to bring up with this is while Activision's basically profit is pretty good, uh, they continue to make, and again, I don't I don't play video games, but I do keep up with them because it is such a large market that I feel like maybe isn't always looked at. Um, but because of their, their kind of nickel and diming that they've done in order to progress it all through a lot of their products, um, they've received a, a pretty bad rap um, among people who play video games. Uh, they effectively destroyed, when Activision took over Blizzard, they destroyed some of their big names, which is World of Warcraft and like Diablo, I think. Uh, and these used to be massive money makers on, on a big level. The problem is, is even though the games themselves are kind of dying out, the money is still there because the people who play will just spend so much money on anything in the game. It's, it's honestly pretty crazy. Um, there's already been a lot of like weird antitrust things regarding Activision and EA. One of the things that they were doing uh, that was massive in the States, and the EU blocked this pretty quickly, um, but they had these things, uh, they were called loot boxes, right? And you'd pay for money in the game, right? So real US dollars for whatever in the game, and then you basically just played a slot machine to see what you would get. You know, then you run into really strange territory with like our kids doing this, which they definitely are because when I was a kid, I was doing it. Um, and so, you know, you're basically teaching kids to gamble. And so that was a major issue that EU had just with Activision itself. Um, and then Microsoft is going larger, um, or creates larger issues, uh, j just with such, it's such a massive monopoly at the end of the day. Um, obviously you still have like EA competing, but Microsoft's acquisition would be huge for the industry. So the European Union regulators on Monday approved Microsoft's proposed 69 billion acquisition. Uh, the EU Commission, um, excuse me, the European Commission said that Microsoft offered remedies in the nascent area of cloud gaming that have staved off antitrust concerns. And these remedies centered along allowing users to stream Activision games that they purchase on any cloud streaming platform, which is a weird thing that they were arguing about anyway. Um, and then Europe's green light uh, is a huge win for Microsoft. Yeah, and the UK doesn't like this at all. And I think some of the MPs came out today and was like, what are you, what are you doing, man? Um, so yeah, this is, this is going to be massive. If that acquisition happens, um, I think the, the people will hold it. Like someone was asking a question, like I have this like in an ETF, what happens? And you get like 95 a share, which is nice since... Um, it's current, Activision's currently trading at 77, but this is still a long, long way to go. So this is what I was talking about with the UK. Uh, the EU decision comes after the UK Competition and Markets Authority last month blocked the deal over concerns it would reduce competition in the cloud gaming market. Well, the CMA said that Microsoft would find it commercially beneficial to make Activision's key games, which Call of Duty, I guess, is still massive, um, exclusive to its own cloud gaming platforms. And that's really what was going on, right? It was like this battle for titles and exclusivity. And then, you know, Microsoft owns Xbox, so they want to sell that platform. And really, they're, they're moving in just to selling, not even like the hardware anymore, but everything is so virtualized nowadays. 
And so they're just putting the ability to run these games on the cloud. Um, I think this would honestly be a huge win uh, for Microsoft in a major way if, if they can somehow convince the UK to do so. I want to hop back over. Um, I'll hop back over. Let's see here. Yeah, I do. The GE again. This is some interesting news. Is their aerospace is going to invest up to twenty million in its Dayton EPIS Center. Uh, construction will begin at the new cell within the River Park Drive facility this summer, and it will be the center's seventh test cell. There's room for eighth test cell within the building, but there's no plans to build one. They're going to invest twenty million into the EPIS, which is Electrical Power Integrated System Center, uh, to build new test cells, bringing nearly a hundred million. Uh, amount that has been invested, excuse me, the amount invested to 100 million on the University of Dayton campus facility in the past decades. So these guys are definitely pushing in. I was looking a little bit more of their fundamentals after the break, and they are like cutting down on cash quite a bit. Um, but this is some good investment, I think. Uh, this is not an announcement that comes lightly. Uh, this has been well in the works for 18 months. NASA recently suggested GE Spirit, excuse me, selected GE Aerospace to develop an integrated megawatt class hybrid electric propulsion system as part of a program dedicated to exploring hybrid electric flight. Plans for ground and flight tests on the hybrid electric systems this decade with Boeing use the modified Saab 340B, that's interesting, and uh, GE CT7 engines. So yeah, there's a lot to, I, I would say, just be a little bit excited about, at least just for like the casual viewer of GE. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with them. I always bring up Argentina, and so does the news, but these guys, <laughs> they, they raise their interest rate to 97% uh, as it struggles to tackle inflation. But I feel like this increases, or at least runs the risk of increasing inflation even more. I mean, you just like, devalue the Argentine peso so heavily by doing this. And I always tell the story, uh, when I was traveling, I was staying in a hostel with this Argentine guy, and uh, he woke up one day, this was like in 2019, and he woke up one day, and that's when like the value of um, Argentina just slashed entirely. They had a new election, and they lost half its value. And I just remember like walking up to him, because we'd always get breakfast together, and I was like, man, how are you doing? And he goes, I, I have no idea what to make of this. And they, they've always had issues. I mean, they owe so much money to the IMF, which they're never going to be able to pay back. Um, but we'll look a little bit more into this. The Central Bank of Argentina raised its key interest rate Monday by six percentage points to 97%, that's 600 basis points, uh, in an effort to tackle soaring inflation that has reached 30 years highs. Oh man, central banks across the globe are struggling to rein in inflation, but it's a particular problem in Argentina, where the annual inflation rate soared above 100% last month. And it's so nuts because this country has so many natural resources. I mean, they're, they're rich in that. And uh, I, I don't know what it is, if it's just corruption or, or what. Um, but the, the president, the current president, is uh, he's not going to run for uh, re-election. So that's interesting. Uh, this is another huge headline, something I was speaking about a little last time. Uh, the consumer debt passes $17 trillion for the first time, uh, despite slide in mortgage demand. And that's such an interesting thing to say, like the slide in mortgage demand. And, and what I... I have this feeling that a lot of what it is is not necessarily a, a slide in demand, but I think that maybe getting a mortgage is, you know, in, in my age group, it's so hard to get one. And I, I think people have been like pushed out of the market in some capacity, right? And so this has slid credit card mortgage, excuse me, um, credit card debt has like stabilized at one trillion. But again, I think we're seeing like kind of more like a V-shaped thing going on or I do think people on like the lower ends um, are getting more credit card debt and people kind of the higher end uh, are not acquiring so much and that's, or maybe they're reducing it. And that's stabilizing uh, that kind of factor. Again, um, you have more people now who are buying something as basic as groceries on credit. And, and so this is where we're seeing this kind of like two tier thing going on and that's resulting in kind of a stabilization. Uh, so the total consumer debt hit a fresh New high this first quarter in 2023 at just over 17 trillion. Uh, new mortgage originations, including refinancings, totaled just 323 billion, the lowest since the second quarter of 2014. Um, again, I don't think everyone who wants a mortgage is getting one right now. And that's kind of what we're looking at. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with this, guys. Stay tuned. We got a little bit left, and we'll just run over some some interesting news when you get back. Thank you.
TFNN has just launched their new trading room, the Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with the Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In the Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFNN.com. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. We are talking about Tesla earlier. This thing is up 4.3% today. I, <laughs> like just this massive reversal. Elon Musk, I, it must have literally been as I was speaking, uh, promised to deliver the Cybertrucks by the end of the year. So there we go. I mean, the market just wants something to go off of. Ford, however, is gonna lose money on their EVs uh, this year. They're gonna lose approximately three billion on its sales of electric vehicles uh, to consumers this year. But overall, it still expects to hit profit targets set for this year between nine and 11 billion. Uh, those EV losses and overall profit both come from expenses and interest, and in, uh, excuse me, before interest and taxes. Uh, the three billion loss is roughly equal, equal to what it lost on EVs on that basis the last two years combined. It said it lost about 900 million in 2021 and 2.1 billion in 2022. Wow. Uh, it's the first time it gave a breakout of the results of its EV operations. It did say it was about to start making money on it soon, going from a 40% operating loss margin last year um, when it sold about 96,000 EVs, uh, bringing in 5.3 billion in revenue to about an 8% profit margin by the end of 2026. Okay. Uh, it expects increased production of EVs to bring global product of those vehicles to a 2 million annual rate by the end of the year. It still is less profitable than Tesla. And Tesla has been doing this for way longer, and they have massive infrastructure uh, regarding the production of these things. I mean, Tesla's even going as far as to like, figure out new ways to extract lithium uh, to make uh, their batteries. You know, they, they, have, they have the whole chain there for the most part. Um, so... <laughs> 
you know, again, I still kind of stand by what I was saying with it. I, I think there is like room uh, for other electric vehicles. Uh, will they be able for, you know, the foreseeable future in the short term, like on a yearly basis to compete with Tesla? I don't know, probably not. And if Elon's coming out and saying that Tesla's gonna get probably hit by larger macroeconomic forces, then I'm certain that other EV makers are gonna get hit as well. Folks, thank you so much for staying uh, tuned with me. I think Basil will be back Monday, so I'll be with you tomorrow and Friday. Uh, folks, have a great rest of your day.